data for most is a business, but for Evan Kerstel, it's an obsession. Evan describes himself as a tech influencer slash evangelist. He has more than 500,000 followers across Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. He's helped companies like Intel, 3M, and AT&T Business grow a massive online audience through organic reach in the tens of millions. Now his company, Avira Health, is leveraging that social media prowess to help clients in the healthcare industry gain visibility, share thought leadership, and deepen user engagement. They act as social media partners to clients in the health tech landscape to create a network of influencers spanning the globe. Avira has worked with the American Heart Association, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts and MedTech Boston, among others. Today, we're talking with Evan about trends he sees in healthcare data, how the pandemic has affected the industry, and the future of health tech. So without further ado, let's get into it. Welcome to Truth Be Known. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Truth Be Known. We have a super exciting guest today. We have Evan Kerstel from Avira Health. Evan, welcome to the show. Tell everybody a little bit about yourself. Yeah, I've spent 30 years in enterprise tech, actually primarily in sales and biz dev and alliances from some big companies like Intel and Oracle and Acme Packet and Audio Codes, company in the telecom and communication space. And really the last seven years almost, I've been an independent sort of solo practitioner out there working with clients on social media content creation and social media marketing and thought leadership and engagement. And frankly, after 30 years, it's nice to be out of the corporate rat race and doing my own thing onwards and upwards. I have a company called Vera Health, and we're super excited about the rise of emerging digital health and health technology companies leveraging technology to empower patients, doctors, and society to really address unique challenges in, in healthcare and create you know amazing content that reaches audiences across the social landscape. Avira Health was a company started by myself and my business partner, Irma Rastagaiva, with a mission of empowering digital health, health tech, and emerging companies in the healthcare space leverage social media for thought leadership and engagement, education and outreach. And we're now working with some amazing brands, companies that you've heard of like Microsoft and 3M, but also emerging tech companies and startups who are really lost on the world of of social media and have challenges getting their voice, sharing their voice and creating compelling content. So we're partnering with these companies as a sort of boutique consultancy to really empower them to be seen, heard, and uh, understood across a variety of social media networks. It is really, really fun to have you here. And it's nice to get um, another long-term Twitter user. Yeah, you know, Twitter has has been fascinating through the pandemic. It's been, frankly, a lifesaver for keeping those connections going, for news and insight into the pandemic, to keeping your personal and professional reputation and street cred alive, you know, while we're not meeting people. Personally, my Twitter account has exploded and engagement has increased and even brands have have upped their game. You know, it's been fascinating to watch that evolve. It is. And in the last 14 months, has it been 14, 15 months, forever? I've lost count. It feels like a decade, but, you know, that's sort of dog years now. So It really is the 500th day of March because it's still March 2020. But just how like human behavior has changed and for what we thought was this brief moment in time to a completely new way of operating and a new way of interacting with people. Yeah, and we're craving connection. And so we're seeking new ways to connect, even though people are zoomed out in many ways. I think video has been a lifeline. Audio has been a lifeline for me. I'm I'm on Clubhouse every day, which is the hot new social media network and doing podcasts like this. We're talking to each other. We're also seeing each other. So that conversational connection has been just such a godsend. I totally agree. I can only imagine what this would have been like if we didn't have Zoom and video conversations and we didn't have this some sort of human connection. If it was, you really can't go anywhere and see anyone. At least we have, at least we've had this for the last thousand days. 
What about your customers? I don't know much about exactly who you work with, but how have they navigated the pandemic and survived, thrived in some cases, maybe? What are they seeing? It's been so interesting. I've seen customers and just have to accelerate digital transformation. The this is good enough no longer made any sense. It is we have to absolutely have the correct data. We have to have it in real time. I have to know what's happening in my business. Went from a nice to have to complete and total table stakes. I, seeing the type of innovation that they've had to think about and that forced change of now, how do you interact with people? Now, what kind of products do you sell? Now, how do you create these personal connections online? One of our customers is Bayer, and they do a lot of really great work. But one of the things that they work on is ventilator production. For, I think they have do 600 ventilators a day or a week now, and they had to massively scale up production. The only way you can do that is with accurate data. And I hear them talking about this and seeing so many businesses see this as an opportunity to move faster, to reinvent, to really thrive. And it is the necessity is the mother of invention. And none of us wanted this. None of us wanted to have to deal with these circumstances. But so many businesses have just found new ways to operate that is really, really um, inspiring and shows this perseverance and grit. Yeah, grit's the key word. I think you said earlier resilience as well, like the two uh, yep. themes of this past year. And the supply chains are disrupted, getting worse even with the semiconductor shortage, with things like that oh, yeah. pipeline uh, shutdown and all kinds of disruptions globally and borders and transportation. It seems like it's getting worse, not better, which is very disturbing. Again, if the pandemic taught us anything, you can't rely on instinct. We can't take anything for granted. And the Past experience doesn't work anymore. And the only way to get to the other side, the only way to be successful is I have to know what's going on and I have to pull data in as quickly as possible to know what's happening. And seeing these levels of innovation popping out of industries that just had to, the hotel industry, e-commerce, CPG, healthcare, healthcare has gone through this massive transformation in the last 14 months. Yeah, I mean, this uh, epidemic was an epidemic of bad or missing data as well. You know, I track all the, the statistics here in New England and Massachusetts just had its first zero death uh, day for COVID. And um, it was a long time getting to the point where we, we understood the data behind the pandemic and infections and vaccinations and tracking. And hopefully we've learned something in this process and we can apply those practices to other businesses and experiences. It's the, again, no one would have ever wanted this, but I am hoping there is a degree of good that comes out of this, that to your point in the healthcare space, maybe we didn't have to get there this quickly, but now the infrastructure you've put in place, the new way of thinking across the healthcare space, I want to believe we can apply to not just dealing with a massive pandemic, but we can apply to hopefully going back to normal life. Yeah, no, and healthcare is such a fascinating space. We're generating all of this sort of exhaust around ourselves from wearables to virtual care to remote patient monitoring and getting all that data into systems in a clean way that doctors, practitioners, can researchers can use to gather insights is so important. Do you believe healthcare in some ways has lagged behind other industries with digital transformation? Why do you think that's happened? Well, it's a tremendously bureaucratic, quasi-public-private partnership. Mm -hmm. if, if you've ever seen a org chart of health and human services, it looks like spaghetti wiring under your desk. It's just so complex, overly complex, and we keep making it more complicated versus simplifying and, uh, and making the patient the center of the universe instead of this bureaucracy or hospitals or insurance companies or what have you. So... We need to make patients the center of care and strengthen the doctor, patient, nurse, patient relationships and empower patients with data and insights and advice and uh, guidance and education. And that's been very slow, to, just slow to, to change. And there's a lot of very antiquated legacy IT systems as well. I mean, how many times you go to a doctor's office and you got to sign in on the clipboard, right? You, you know, I mean, this kind of stuff is just endemic and in healthcare. And it, it, I, I see, I've seen massive change, like even over the pandemic, we've seen virtual care and telehealth go from 1% utilization to 35, 40%. 
and it's, it's going to fall back some, but even the adoption of digital services like telehealth or some of the monitoring tools or remote patient care have, have really taken off out of necessity. Like you said, yeah. they've had to react and respond and adopt. So, you know, if there's a, a light at the end of the tunnel, maybe it's been some of the adoption of these new technologies and hopefully it won't fall back into our very bureaucratic old school way of thinking in healthcare. Do you remember this time last year where it was, you know, two weeks and you're going, no, it'll be three months. And we only thought it was going <laughs> to be a few months. And if it was only a few months, I don't think behavior would really change because it was, we'll do this for a little while. It's fun and silly to work from home. You no, know, I'll stop and I'll feed my kids. It's a novelty where after 14 or 15 months and counting, it's no longer a novelty. It is deep behavioral changes. I, as much as I want to go back to the office and see people, the idea of commuting five days a week just seems overwhelming. Well, especially with San Francisco traffic and Boston's the same. We went from like the number one most congested city to like the number 50. So uh, overnight, you know, I hope we don't go back to exactly what we had before because that would be disappointing. And I think there are things we can learn and also out of necessity. I mean, in the U.S., we're, we're maybe at the beginning of the end here, but globally, we have these variants and it's not over till it's over, you know, in terms of borders and variants and uh, booster shots. And and we're just not there yet, despite every everyone's sort of anticipatory celebrating the reduction in deaths and illness. So, you know, I don't think this is just going to disappear. I mean, even the Spanish flu from the 1918 pandemic never really disappeared. It morphed into what we have today, which is the common flu. So these things have a tendency to uh, have very long tails, sadly. I know. And it's so easy to forget that in the U.S. things feel like there's a light at the end of the tunnel. We're going in a good direction. But then the rest of the world isn't there yet. And we are a, a very obviously global, but if something is happening in India or in another country, we can't assume that is not going to have a global impact. And it, I hope and aspire for us to be in a place where everyone is having that same positive direction that we're having. You know, you had zero deaths in Massachusetts. What can we do so that that's happening on a more global scale? Otherwise, this is going to be whack-a-mole of it just keeps, it just keeps coming. Yeah, and half of my clients, friends, co colleagues in tech are from other parts of the world, India and Europe and Brazil. And it's definitely, they're, they're in the midst of this fight and it's so tragic to see. And most Americans, you know, they don't really watch the news. So we think just about our short-term prospects, but yeah, very, very challenging. So um, cross fingers, I think it's going to be a long slog. I think it'll be a long slog. And I, I want to believe we are getting... It is painful in parts of the world, but it will start to have a rolling turn across everywhere. And I go back to this has caused a long-term behavioral shift in how all of us work and operate and live and interact, that this is not a next week. There's no more cases globally. Fantastic. We won't go back to the way things were. It just, we're wired differently now. It's 15 months of wiring. And I, even on the healthcare side, I don't see telemedicine all of a sudden going back to one or 2% because now we all know I can get on my phone and I could talk to a doctor on my phone and I don't have to get up and wait in line and go in when I'm sick. I can have a conversation to decide if I need to come in. And it's amazing. Even the doctors are seeing the value in terms of them collaborating with other doctors and using other tools to to do research. And so it, the whole system has gone virtual, not just on the patient side. So that's been really eye-opening. And yeah, we'll, we'll take the silver lining of that dark cloud anytime. Yeah, it's there There has to be. I'm the eternal optimist. There has to be the silver lining. <laughs> and what do you think about the future? What do you think are going to be, even in the healthcare space, some of the biggest changes that are still to come and still to roll out? Well, I, I think there there's so many changes. I mean, there's a move to the empowered patient, the educated patient, so patients who can take care of and manage their conditions on their own. So whether it's like an Apple Watch with diabetes, glucose monitoring built in, or a remote patient monitoring into the home for aging in place, or a lot of that technology is going to be in the home and make us safer and more secure and allow us to, to not have to visit the hospital 
or even the doctor's office. So that takes a big challenge off the plate. So I think technology has a big role. And I think doctors are beginning to think differently, whether it's working independently in sort of concierge medicine or whether it's, you know, offering their services via telehealth, direct to patient kind of care, house visits are back. So all all kinds of ways that the relationship with the patient and doctor is, is evolving. But I think I'm, yeah, I'm most excited about as a techie, the use of technology to take ownership of my health data, to manage it with not just a Fitbit measuring my steps, but all kinds of interesting technologies, wearables, potentially glasses and other things that will keep me healthy and, you know, be able to detect disease early, earlier than we ever could before in terms of screening and genomics and other things. So I'm really excited about that empowerment as a patient. And that's just only going to accelerate. I I love that. And honestly, I hadn't even thought about that. And it's being able to detect issues, disease, conditions, early. That is what is truly going to save lives. There's almost no cancer that isn't treatable if it's detected early. Exactly. And the, you know, the single drop of blood test now for cancer screening, the testing for Alzheimer's a decade or two before it it sets in, diabetes before it's uh, chronic, all these things will allow us to live better lives. It is. And there's, I can't remember the name of the movie, but there is this movie where basically the rich people live on spaceships and the poor people are mining on Earth. Is Elon Musk in that, or is that is that another uh, movie? That I, must be something. I think he was. I, I think he was. I think he made the spaceships, uh, and he's up there. I mean, it's a good point because there is a huge divide between, again, the people that have who can leverage all this technology and afford great care, and have good broadband, and you know the have-nots and this gap who are being left behind and. With, with all of this. So you know, like everything, there's a big challenge as well as an opportunity. It's funny you say that. I hadn't even thought about some of that as, and in this movie, the people on the spaceship, every day they get a scan. And at one point it's, you have one cell that could be irregular that might lead to cancer. So we're just going to eradicate that cell right now. So you're not going to get sick. But the people that are the minors living on earth are dying in their 20s of preventable diseases. Very, very sad, very scary. Yeah, I have a client who's looking at rolling out a, a number of, starting in, in uh, Beverly Hills of all places, but walk-in scan clinics where you walk in and you get basically a full scan, a full magnetic resonance scan of your body. And then you have a consultation with a specialist who then can refer you on to your doctor if he sees, you know, blood vessels that have issues or lumps or other things. And it's like a thousand bucks. So this, this kind of medicine is is happening, being rolled out as we speak. And which is going to be great if you have the thousand dollars to just pop in and get a full body scan. <laughs> How old did you go? And maybe you go, you know, every couple of months. Yeah, the reason it's in Beverly Hills, that was the targeted demographic for that uh, service. But let's hope like other things, it scales up and the costs go down and it becomes ubiquitous. And, you know, it's in Walmart maybe one day, but we'll see how that goes. And people could go there and sort of access this type of preventative care, because if you really want to decrease health care costs, preventative care, so we're not getting we're not getting sick. I mean, the, the dirty little secret is, you know, 10 percent of the population generate 90 percent of the cost of care. Now, that's also elderly and older people, but they're still within that spectrum. There's just so much health and wellness improvements that could be made. Exactly. And even thinking about the vaccine rollout with COVID right now, the thing that I am afraid of is we create two worlds and two societies. And we already have a divide between the wealthy and the not wealthy. But first of all, the vaccine technology that has rolled out is completely incredible. And the mRNA vaccines, I'm just, when you learn more and more about that, are absolutely incredible about the future of healthcare. And there's part of me that is so optimistic for the future of how you can apply this to disease and overall health and wellness. But the downside of this is part of the world has this and is finally starting to thrive. And then part of the world feels left behind. Yeah. Now, if you really want to go dystopian sci-fi on that, let's say you have your child uh, genes edited for intelligence and wealth and height and eye color 
And then that child then competes with my child who hasn't had his uh, genome edited with CRISPR. And all of a sudden you have actual have and haves nots in terms of someone who's had their genes edited and someone who hasn't, someone who can afford that procedure and someone who hasn't, or maybe, you know, a population here in the U.S. has had it as all of a sudden genomically, genetically superior to someone outside the U.S. So we get in some really hairy areas. So I I like your movie reference because that's kind of where we're going to be in in five to ten years. It's the Gattaca of everything. (laughs) I'm hearing a sci-fi buff. So yes, a a little watchable uh, movie. Yes. It is, and it's fascinating. And I think of things like the annual checkup, because this is the the future. And if you go to today, that the way that we all used to interact with a doctor is maybe you had that annual checkup. But to the point you had earlier, there's wearables now. There's all of these different things that could that collect all of these indicators from your heart rate to blood sugars. And it's setting that foundation for this future where I know Larry Ellison is putting a ton of money behind it as well. But it's I wonder why he's doing that. But, Probably that's a good reason. Because we all want to live forever. I just want my health yeah, exactly. to be what lives forever, not my health in 50 years to be what lives forever. And it's the massive data world and data problem and sort of data opportunity that we're creating within all of this. And it's, if we can detect issues sooner, you can get better treatment. We can have this better life and death. And I just, I think it is fascinating that this idea of pulling in all these different data sources and data observability can save lives and improve lives. But we also have to make sure that this is equitable and accessible and not just Larry Ellison and 18 other, not even billionaires, like multi, multi multi-billionaires have access to it. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, my my favorite new product is this Aura Ring. I don't know if you know the Aura Ring, but it's basically a wearable device. It's a ring, obviously, that you charge once a week, and it collects all of not just your movement, but temperature and all kinds of things. And it will tell you very subtle changes in body temperature. So I have an app if my body temperature were, were to fluctuate, not just high or low, but all above the norm, it would send me a, a note saying you potentially could have, have had covid because you have a slightly elevated body temperature that, that wouldn't even be recognized on taking your, your temperature through a thermometer. So it was a fascinating experiment. It tracks sleep and deep sleep and REM sleep and steps and movement. And th- these kind of things are now a couple hundred bucks out on the street. So it's a really interesting time. And it is just the beginning. It is this idea of like, you're collecting your own data. You're learning all of this about yourself. And what I'd love to see is then how we take this and we have the power of our own data. And then we have maybe one day when the scanner is something that is more accessible and we're all doing, or even when you just go to a regular doctor's visit and they do blood work, this idea of pulling this all together to get this complete picture of you, of your health to know 98.2 seems like a good temperature because you're supposed to be 98.6, but you really run at 97, so 98.2 is an early sign of a fever for you. And maybe you should check out other things. Like that's where this idea of pulling in different data sources becomes super, super interesting for me. Totally. And I'd love that. I would happily give access to my iPhone, to my doctor and this Mm -hmm. data, give it up if it would help him uh, help me. Mm -hmm. But right now the doctors, these hospitals, they wouldn't know what to do with it. They don't know what to do with your health data or your iPhone uh, tracking, or they say, okay, nice, go go get your blood work done. That's kind of their response. So we really need to wake up and leverage uh, this, the data exhaust that's coming off our bodies and wearables and devices. I think one day soon, I think the, this is, again, the trying to find a silver lining in the challenging 15 months. I do believe COVID has forced change and forced digital transformation and has sped this up out of necessity. We had to do it. And I think it's going to accelerate a lot of this. Um, My personal belief is this is going to accelerate a lot of innovation in so many industries, especially in the healthcare space. Yeah, it's been great to see all the investment being made. One of my clients is UpHealth. They're doing a huge SPAC, raising tens of billions of dollars. And, you know, we, we put billions into silly apps on our phone. It's great to see money being put into things like health tech and ed tech and, and data science and, and things that are going to make us live 
better lives and not just play games. So it's that's been a positive outcome of this kind of strange economy and situation we're in too. Definitely. I would love to dream up our dystopian future and <laughs> how the world is going to go. But I want to switch to rapid fire part of our interview. Great. Okay, so I have several questions that are quick decisions. Don't overthink it. Are you ready? I am ready. So what is one talent or skill that is not on your resume? I'm a, I'm a big reef tank hobbyist. So I have 120 gallon saltwater aquarium and coral and fish. And that's been great during the pandemic, just to the, the relaxation and the vibe of the tank. And it's at home, obviously. So great hobby to do at home. So that's been a lifesaver during the pandemic. It's really cool. Yeah, no, it's really fun. And they have a good time with the fish. Where do you put a 120 <laughs> gallon fish tank? It's in the bedrooms. It's a pretty big uh, feature of my my bedroom. Yeah. Nice. I feel like in my head, it's an entire wall. <laughs> no, it's not quite Larry Ellison style, but uh, it's, it's it, I don't need a humidifier. Let's put it that way. Nice. So if you weren't in tech or in business, what would you be doing? Tech or business? Well, I think I'd be a marine biologist. I love just the ocean. I love traveling. I love nature and animals and you know, things like going whale watching in Massachusetts, or I, I a couple of years ago saw a great white shark out on the Cape. I volunteered in my youth at the, an aquarium. So yeah, I, I love just the uh, connection with the ocean and the sea and sailing and boating and that kind of thing. Oh, I love that. So what is the book or TV show or podcast that you've been binging? You, you know, so many. I almost have to look because there's so many. I love history, World War II history. So I've been just binging everything about World War II and the Blitz. And you talk about resilience and survival. I mean, look at what the Brits had to do in London during the, uh, the raids and the attacks in World War II. Talk about keep calm and carry on. I mean, that was sacrifice. That was survival. That was resilience. Mm -hmm. And I wish, you know, more of us could have that mentality <laughs> for the past year it would have probably made a big difference to what happened. But yeah, I love, I love history around uh, that era in particular. Last question. What piece of advice would you give the younger version of yourself? I would say buy Bitcoin. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I would say an Apple and, you know, Tesla and yeah, I'd but in all seriousness, I think I think I would have invested more, saved, not save in the sense of like putting in the bank account, but just really thought more about investing like really early. If you look at any of the big tech stocks, you know, you don't have much money in your 20s, but gosh, even 100 bucks then or 500 bucks. I didn't start saving till a little later, but that would have been a big win. I could not agree with you more. It's I also did not do that. And I would be in a much better place had I put money in a Roth IRA when I was 22. Who did no one write? No, <laughs> no, no one does that. No, no. But actually, there, there's some fintechs apps now that I've turned my daughter on. She's 22. That actually take that approach through an app. It gamifies it. It makes it easy. It, it kind of just rounds up spare change. And Acorn is the oh. one I, I turned her on to. And yeah, but they didn't, they didn't have apps like that. We didn't have phones. We didn't have the internet. We had nothing. So I would have had to like walk into a Morgan Stanley broker and go, I want to open a Roth IRA. I mean, no one was doing that when I was 20. So, well, you know, this generation maybe has a better shot. I thought the stock market was Wall Street with Bud Fox and Gordon Gecko. I thought that was the stock. I don't want to do that. That's, that's evil. That's like what these, these evil guys are doing. So yeah, it was the Hollywood for you. Versus, I really like this Apple computer. Maybe if I take my money that I got for my birthday, <laughs> that I've been keeping in a box under my bed, I put that into Apple. And if I did that, I would be rich. <laughs> this has been an absolute, absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on the show with us. Oh, do you have any parting words of wisdom or advice? You know, it, it's never too late to, to dive in on social media. We met on social media, whether it's Twitter or LinkedIn or Clubhouse, just, just connect. Don't read the headlines about how terrible it is. And it really can be a great community to connect, to share, to get educated, to build your brand, to find a job, whatever you need to do, just find your tribe out there. And it's, it's, it's well worth it. Absolutely. It's, it makes, it removes borders and makes the world a lot smaller. Yeah. And, and, and there's so many great people to connect with when you disregard all the garbage and trolling and politics. So just get on with it.
Awesome. Thank you again so much. And thank you everybody for listening. Truth Be Known is brought to you by Talent. A leader in data integration and data integrity, Talent enables every company to find clarity amidst the chaos. Talent Data Fabric brings together in a single platform all the necessary capabilities that ensure enterprise data is complete, clean, compliant, and readily available to everyone who needs it throughout the organization. Learn more at talend.com. That's T-A-L-E-N-D.com.